So mm -hmm. that, that, <laughs> that, that code that you have is about your duties, your conduct, mm -hmm. it's everything. Mm -hmm. And that is what leads to self-preservation. Mm -hmm. So, so self-love is self-preservation. Absolutely. And you for taking your seats and um, I'm going to start with we're going to have to amalgamate some of the topics now because of the time so sorry about that in advance um, but first I just want to reintroduce our lovely sister Charmaine Simpson because there was probably nobody better really to talk about black love in and as business than this woman who's been running it for the last 12 years black history studies so I'm going to quickly pass over to Charmaine. She's going to tell us a little bit, a bit about, about that in a couple in business. Yeah. I'm going to stand up because so, I'm a little bit. <laughs> so greetings, everyone. Greetings, greetings, greetings. So I'm just, I've got, I can talk for England. I've got two minutes. So I'm going to give you a remix, a short and condensed version of what we're doing. Why? Go sit down. I don't know why. That wasn't planned. <laughs> she wants to come up here. And the reason, um, so uh, my name is Charmaine Simpson. So um, we run Black Issue Studies and Black Issue Study Tours um, as a husband and wife team. And our business is a very family orientated business. Yeah. Um, so let's give a remix about how me and Mark met. So me and Mark um, met, um, I was doing my economics degree on a one year placement at Departments of Trade and Industry, as he calls, Mark calls it Department of Slays and Industry, and there's a reason why he says that. Um, sitting at my desk, didn't know nobody, and I was to see this big, tall, six foot three black man walking past. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> I didn't know him, he was like, so you don't know nobody, come talk to me. And as you do, as when you're in an environment where you, there's not much of us, when black people see each other, like, you're automatically gonna come together. And, we just started talking. We started talking about the Heart of Harsden program. Oh, did you watch that? And we started talking. And then me and my far self go, do you want to go to lunch? And I was like, where did that come from? <laughs> okay. Then we went to lunch and I just started sitting down talking to this gentleman and just, and I, you know when it just instantly clicks? And I remember he said to me, I'm, I'm a good cook, you know? And if anybody who knows Mark knows that his hand is good. He can cook. Yeah. I was like, you can't cook. He goes, all right, I'm going to cook you. I think it was banana porridge he cooked. No, it wasn't. Banana porridge was the second time. First time he caught me acting saltfish. And sat down, and I'm, I'm a foodie, love food. Fe um, brought the food in, ate the food. I thought, oh, this is really nice. I could marry he. But at the time, I wasn't even with, I was with another guy. Wasn't even watching him. I was just laughing and joking with him, as you do. And long story short, um, friendship happened, mentorship happened. Mark is older than me, so he used to say things that, um, most people wouldn't say. Mark is very straight talking. He will tell you things that people wouldn't say. So when I be moaning about something, goes, what are you moaning for? Do this. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> and I love that when somebody's just straight to, straight to the point, sometimes it can get on your nerves, <laughs> but straight to the point. And the reason why we set up Black Issue Studies, so relationship happened, everything happened. Um, Mark was working for Department of Training and Industry. He got um, he has very complex health issues. Um, they tried to um, get rid of him. Mark, being the smart, intelligent man that he is, took them to the um, Department of Trade and Industry to a tribunal for disability discrimination. They tried to take the liberties, but they don't know who this man was. He's the only one, he's out of five people that was able to take the um, Department of Trade and Industry to tribunal case and won. And he won. And what he said was, yeah. He got a compensation package from that tribunal case. He said, I don't want to go back onto the plantation. <laughs> and then he said, I don't want to go back onto the plantation. I said, I beg you, please do not. Um, what do you want to do? And I thought, oh, why don't you need vest? Go and sit down in Jamaica and relax. Because he was 
wasn't well. I said, go on. He goes, no, I want to put his money into the community. So we invested that money into Black History Studies. So we're a self-funded organization. We said that we want to be self-funded because we know once they give you some funding, they gag you and all that kind of stuff. And we said, we don't, nobody tell us nothing. We bought our own equipment, everything we did, and we're self-funding. Even if we have to sell patty, Mark make a cup of soup, we do that and we fund our business that way. Um, three years down the line, we set up um, Black History Studies tours as a result of me and Mark like to travel. When we travel, we always make friends all over the place and we tell people about where we're going. Some people have come with us and they said, you know what, when you're going next, come with us. And I thought, you know what, let's organize some, do it something more structured because we are now we're global African people. We like to travel sometimes. You may have friends that don't want to go nowhere, but you will be that one person traveling all around by yourself. I said, you know what, let's set up Black History Studies. So we did tours to Egypt. We got our Egypt tour. We have our, we did a Moorish Spain tour. We did, um, We've got our black Amsterdam, Paris, anywhere where there's black people, global African people, we make friends with and make links to. So that's basically um, a quite a short summary about what we do. And through Black History Studies, going back to the topic of love, when we do our events, we are so blessed to have so much people that have walked through our doors at Black History Studies. Every person, every student feels loved. Um, they come through the doors and we've actually had Black History Study weddings. So we've had three weddings and about four babies that have resorted from Black History Studies. Yeah? And this is what we have to do. So Black History Studies don't just talk about nation building and Garvey and want to recite everything from Garvey and that's it. We, are about, we, have to, we have to own it. So if I'm talking about supporting black businesses, I'm doing that. Black business here, black business here. Always supporting. You have to practice what you preach. And also embed that in your business. So not just, we don't just teach black history. Mark is one of them people that um, he's had experiences, especially growing up in Brixton, where you go as a, young, as a black man going through exclusion at school. He has gone no, countless times with single mothers to go into the school and sit down with single mothers to encourage them to keep their children in school. He's done that. And what I would say to people, when you're setting up your business, have somebody that is supportive with you. I cannot do black history studies without Mark. Mark is very integral to the Black History Studies. Even though you see me all the time, Mark is the one there that is um, the supporter. We reason, we debate, we don't always agree. We debate about things, we work together as a, as a family unit. We could not do Black History Studies if we wasn't a family unit because as people know, we work tirelessly. We don't just appear in Black History Month and disappear. No, we work throughout the whole year and we have to do that. And you need somebody strong who are gonna be with you when you're going through the ups and downs in business. And we have been through ups and downs. We've had some experiences where I've always almost had to tump down people. I've had, and I'm a tourist, so when I get vexed, I get vexed. And if it wasn't for Mark speaking, no, Charmaine, you can't do it that way. <laughs> do it this way. You have to be, have that strong person to work with you and you have to work as a partnership and team. Communication is very key. Um, we have to um, think about how we run our businesses and support each other. I'm trying to think of all the things I was going to say. But yeah, just say thank you to everybody for supporting Black History Studies throughout the years and just keep supporting us and doing what we're doing. Um, love the fact that um, Ayala invited us down because Ayala was one of our past students as well. So we've also worked with her. We've worked with a number of people in the room and we're just trying to support each other and be the people in, of the community and be a um, person that, be an organization that people can actually come to, reach out to and work together and support each other. And we have to be um, that organization and be that people. And don't listen to the hype that um, all black men are what this and black women are this and all that kind of nonsense. And don't watch what other people are doing in their relationships. Because I know in my relationship, certain things can't run. It doesn't work like that for everybody else. So Mark is a brilliant cook. He does the majority of the cooking. I can hand, hold up my hand and say he is a better cook than I am. So what works for you in your relationship? Play to each other's strengths and benefits and just go ahead and speak to other people and get support from other people as well, especially in your business. Okay. I'm getting rushed off. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. They often say don't mix business with pleasure or family. And these guys are testament to that it's rubbish. And I just want to just ask um, Daniel and Jarrell to share a few points because they wrote a really brilliant post the other day on Facebook 
which they may want to share, may not, but I just want to hear a little bit from them as a couple in business. He's ready. Cool. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. For those that have just come, I'm Daniel, Jarrell King. Uh, we run Fit for a King, that's over there. It's a lifestyle brand, but what we have over there is our skincare and our toothpaste. All natural, no preservatives, no, it's all organic and yeah, the good stuff. Um, I was going to talk for days, but as soon as you requested this, I am going to read this. I'm going to read it. It's a Facebook, Instagram post that I wrote the other day. Um, I take long to write these posts, that's why I can't remember it, so I'm just going to read. It's just the pros and cons and some tips. It's entitled Business Owners and Lovers, Pros and Cons. Mm -hmm. And this is just my experience. So, Sorry, Daniel, can I just ask you to stand up for some of the people at the back who might want to see your lovely face? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Business owners and lovers, pros and cons. Oh, she don't want to talk about it. <laughs> pros. Um, trusted business partners who better, who better to trust than your spouse. Unified front. Both partners are vested in the business, outcomes, and are dedicated. Getting through the tough times strengthens the relationship. Mm -hmm. Flexibility to adjust for other responsibilities like family and health obligations. Spending more time together. Um, some couples hardly see their partners due to work schedules. Owning a business together is a guaranteed way to spend time together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes too much time. <laughs> um, cons, financially putting all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. When times are tough, they are really tough. Mm -hmm. Um, can't wait or get fired even when you want to. <laughs> Relationships could feel like a business arrangement. Mm -hmm. Spending all your time together, it can be really hard to work with your spouse or anyone you have a romantic relationship with on a day-to-day -day basis and then go back to the uh, romantic side because you are with them 24-7. And then some tips. Decide specifically role, specific roles based upon individual strengths and talents. Remember to separate work, work life, and set restrictions on bringing work and talk of work activities into mm -hmm. your personal life. Don't forget to take the time to communicate with your partner just like you would any other business professional versus assuming that they know, that they know you well enough to know, your, or to know all your expect, expectations. I feel like I haven't read since school. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take things personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I laugh because I take things personally. <laughs> Don't take things personally. Some things your partner says could have an entirely different effect than someone you're not romantically involved with, like mm -hmm. a co-worker or an employee, mm -hmm. especially if, you've taken, if, if it's taken as criticism. Um, sorry, people are messaging. Don't take up, don't take each other for granted because I'm in the right place. Yeah. Don't take each other for granted because you're around them 24/7. Mm -hmm. Scale back the professionalism and superhero expectations that you tend to place on your partner. You'll both make mistakes and miss deadlines, so you can't place a higher expectation on that person just because you they've always expect exceeded your expectations as your spouse. Mm -hmm. And the last tip: take a step back and enjoy work that you've done. Don't let your natural tendencies to strive for continuous improvements impede, uh -huh. um, impede your ability to enjoy your business and your spouse. So, I hope you got something from that. I've got a little more time. Yeah? I just, no. All right. I just want to say, for us, business is about legacy. Um, legacy, legacy, legacy. I can't say it enough. The reason we started this business is because we have eight children and one grandson. Mm. So, I'm a granddad, yes. Wow. So, for us, not having what, like when I was growing up, I was like, where's the rich people in our family? Where's the businesses? Mm. Like, where, where are all these things? And it's like, is there no one rich in our family? Is no mm. one got, like, does no one own their own house? Like, mm. So that was disappointing to me. One, because I wanted something to be passed down to me, and two, because, just because. So, I needed to start that from somewhere, so it had to start with us. So, I changed my name. I got rid of Gordon. I didn't like that second name, Gordon, Scottish. I ain't Scottish. So, I changed my name, and that was a 
a chapter to begin something new for for me and the missus. Mm. It was the beginning of okay. So if they don't remember what was before me, they're going to remember it from here. Mm. The traditions that we set, the business that we build, they're gonna you know they're gonna take this on one day, and they're gonna I'm gonna have something to pass down to our eight children. So that's the reason why we started our business. Thank you, Daniel. I'm just going to move on to introduce some more of our panellists, our speakers. We've got Victoria and Ade Ogun Sanya. And um, they're from the Black Marriage Network. And I just want, to, want them to speak um, about their concept why they started it and why it's important for us to have the black in front of that. <laughs> they, be in your courage. God is behind your ancestors. <laughs> Hi everyone. Good evening. I'm so sorry I am late. I had to run over from an enrollment and quickly get down here, but my husband was here hiding in the back and he's kind of left me <laughs> to, to talk. So. Black Marriage Network. Why did we start up Black Marriage Network? So we've been married for nearly six years. Um, yeah, for that. Still married, still alive, and haven't killed each other. <laughs> um, yes, um, we met in church. It was divine intervention. Um, I was saying to God, I want a black man, I want a black man, I want a black man, but if it's not a black man, um, okay, but I, I want a black man. That's where I was. <laughs> <laughs> and if he gave me a black man, thank God. But I was also saying to him, um, I didn't grow up in Africa, and my parents, my parents are hippies. Yeah, hippies. So all their friends were not Africans necessarily. The white leftists, real hippies. We went to a hippie school. I don't know if you've heard of. The Rudolf Steiner School, that was one of the schools. Oh, yeah. So real, real hippie. Not only, that was what, what they were doing. They were South Africans wanting from apartheid and they mm -hmm. just wanted something new. So that was genuinely what they were doing. Um, so I didn't really grow up with the typical African household and didn't have the language and things like that. Um, and I realized that about myself. I thought, I think I need a UK guy. Lord, I think I need a UK guy. So people used to counsel me, my friends, and they would always be like, oh, but what if God brings, like, <laughs> an African guy? And it was like, um, but God, you know we've had this conversation, but, okay, but no, 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 no. And it was my daughter that said to me, I was a single parent for 10 years, by the way, so I encourage all of you single parents, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> God has somebody for you. Hold on, hang in there. I just felt I should encourage people. I know some of us here are single, don't worry about it, it's not a thing, you're in the right place. Thank you, Dean and Iola, for, for organizing this. And um, she told me, oh, I had a dream. I was just like, no, 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 no. My husband is Nigerian, born in Nigeria, raised in Nigeria. <laughs> he hadn't even been here. I don't even think we, we spoke, literally. We went to a small church, and I think maybe we said hello. And even when I said hello to him, he was with his Yoruba friend, speaking Yoruba, so I don't even think he even answered. <laughs> He was like, whatever, yeah, you're in the church. So when my daughter said that, I just laughed. Ha! No, 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 no. Um, but God bless him. I'm sure somebody, God has somebody for him. To cut a long story short, my pastor was like, uh, do you know Brother Kule? He wants to marry you. Yeah! <laughs> okay. Okay, faster than pray, but I didn't really, really want to fast and pray. It was just like, not really. And my pastor would be like, she would really happy. Are you happy? I'm like, we don't even talk, we don't know any, we don't even know. What do you mean he wants to marry me? He wants to marry me. And he too, he wasn't even interested. He was come from Nigeria, he had just broken up with the lady he thought he was gonna marry because he'd come here. So he wasn't checking me, I was not checking him. It was all God, it was all God, and I didn't want to pray because I was scared. I was just like, Lord, oh, a whole different culture. How would I cope? How would you cope? When I want to do my British girl thing and cuss him out, how would he understand? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, no, just no, Lord. I want to be married forever. Let's just not do it. And I didn't pray because I was just fighting that. But when I just actually just went and prayed, I had the peace and I knew. <laughs> I knew it was of the Lord and... We started to date, we started to call. Five months later, we got married. Praise God. Wow. So now we're 
now we're in the marriage. <laughs> and the marriage you don't prepare for will scare you when you enter it. They say love is blind. Yes, we loved each other. Love is blind, but marriage will open up both your eyes. It will cure any blindness. Get married, get married, get married. And we just realized that, you know what? We're going to have to work here. We're going to have to pray here. We're going to have to be intelligent. We're going to have to be intentional. We're going to have to use mm -hmm. wisdom. We're going to have to find some people that have been on this roadmap before. Because mm -hmm. if you listen to people, oh, don't get married. You don't need to do any of that. No, our community needs that. Our Absolutely. community needs to see children in a black marriage happy mm -hmm. working it out. It's not always rosy all the time, but they need to see us stick it in there. Mm -hmm. If Jews can marry, we can marry. Right. If Muslims can marry, we can marry. Why, why should we say we're just going to be living together 2050? No. That means we're not preparing our, we're not preferring ourselves in the way that we say. Absolutely. If we can't put the risk on, our, not even the risk, but it may feel like a risk. Especially if you're coming from a place where mom and dad isn't together, it didn't work out, all you see is divorce and happiness all around you. You may just be thinking, actually, I don't need to marry. I don't need to marry, but we need marriage because marriage is putting everything on the table, as my brother said. You're investing your life. You're becoming one with that person. And we believe that there is purpose in everything we do. Mm -hmm. So we had a few cultural and uh, communication problems, needless to say. <laughs> I was Miss Messi. I know, yes, 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 it's not good. I felt bad for all the black British women that they told my husband about in Nigeria that, no, 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 no. <laughs> I really felt bad. Sorry, sisters, sorry, sisters. I know we're not like that, but that was my, that was my issue coming from where I was coming from that I needed to sort out. And with my husband, he wasn't the big community. Kenta, as I am here, he's sitting, I'm talking. We get the picture, he's Mr. Calm and Collected. That's who he is. So there was a lot of struggle there because I didn't understand that when he went silent, there was, um, I didn't know if he was happy or anything like that. And I didn't realize in Nigerian culture, when you go to say to somebody, is, is everything okay? Um, it's always you, whether you did something or not, it's always you apologize. I didn't understand that, I just thought it was, yeah cultural differences and um it's something that we this is looking at me we have cultural differences in our relationships even if we're africans even if we're caribbeans and that's mm -hmm. okay to admit that because we can learn about it and we set up the network because we felt that some of our um christian couples even though they were lovely they weren't necessarily being vulnerable mm -hmm. in some of the things they went to everything was just like yeah praise the lord yeah Yes, we love God, all of that, but we need to be intelligent and we yes. need to understand where we are and we need wisdom. We need to be intentional about it. So we wanted to see other black couples doing well so that we would be encouraged. So we thought, what do we like doing? We like events. Let's round up some experienced couples who are doing well and let's hear from them. And that's why we started Black Marriage Network. We were tired of all the don't get married, there's no good marriages. We were tired of all the rubbish we see on TV. We wanted to see good representation of marriages, so that is why we set up that marriage network. And we've nearly been going a year, so it's still in baby stages. And thank you very much for sharing that, Victoria. Um, so we're going to move on now to a hot topic that might take us a little bit longer, but we're going to try and condense it. Is black love? under attack. <laughs> yes? Right, so we're going to look specifically at representation in the media um, and we're going to also draw on the emasculation of black men. I want to start from Paul and just to introduce you to another of our couples here. Um, we've got Paul and Terry McKenzie from Soaperbox Real, Talk in Real Talking Inspiration. And I'm sure you've seen some of their videos that have been circulated, they've been going viral um, for the last few years, sharing very hard-hitting news. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just check it out on YouTube. They're doing some really important, important work that needs our support as well. So um, we've also got as well Tony Dada, um, who's a, a creative entrepreneur. So we're gonna hear from, from the panel. This is the rest of the panel, so. Just, just like that. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going I'm to first of all, how long have I got? Two minutes. 
Just to yeah, come on. Yeah. Okay, so I've been in business 25 years with this wonderful woman, the business of raising a family. Uh, we have five, six children, two grandchildren, and we are not having any more. <laughs> that chapter's done. Okay, I guarantee you that. I've taken all the precautions. Um, <laughs> might be the first time you know that. <laughs> what have I just done? <laughs> so, um, for me, a few years ago, uh, I sat at my dining room table. I was coming out of a plantation job, which I, um, in, in fact, kind of led me to do what I'm doing now because in that job I worked with young black boys and the organization I was working with was manhandling young black boys, um, literally sitting on their chest on the floor and I said, I'm not having this, I'm going to film this and take it to the BBC. Long story short, took it to the BBC, the BBC played with the story, made the organization look like they were just helping the boy out. Wow. So I decided from that point, I need to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. So we sat at our dining room table and I said to her, I'm so upset at this because they took me for a disciplinary which would have made people commit suicide. You know, these academies mm. are devils, mm. yeah, for our children. So she's turned around and said, well, why, you got a camera. Why don't you go tell stories? And so I got up and I literally, it was like a brainwave. I said to myself, you're absolutely right. Why don't I just pick up the camera and go and tell real life stories? And so since that, that's all I've been doing, is going out there telling real life stories, making awareness videos, uh, trying to bring back the love into the community. Uh -huh. And it brings me on to that difficult topic that you're saying there. So what was the question again? <laughs> no, I have to, I have to listen to, you have to listen to this careful. Are we under attack? Are we under attack? I would say absolutely under attack. This is the next wave of videos that I'm doing is addressing the fact that not only we as ourselves are seeing less and less power in the black man, but the media is perpetuating this. Mm -hmm. And it's been yeah. done at such a secret... Somebody just turned me up, is that you trying to... Yeah. It's been done at such a level because being privy to so many different organisations, I'm actually amazed at some of the tables that I get to sit at. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? The other day I was sat at a table and it was only when they told me it was a Masonic meeting, I got up and left. <laughs> That's how, when I say you take control of your own media, you know what I'm talking yeah, yeah. about. Doors open. So the whole point about changing the narrative and whether the black love is under attack, it's been under attack for me for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Since I committed, and since I committed to be a black upstanding person in my community, every single day is a battle. Yes. Because every single day, something else will tell you, go that way. Yeah. Absolutely. And so for me, the battle of this 25-year relationship is something that I celebrate anywhere I go. It's not been easy. Mm -hmm. It's been hard. But now, when I look out, and I forgot who, who is it that I think the brother said it. When you look out in the media now, and being a person from the media and trying to change the narrative, the images that you see mm -hmm. are so concerning. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, only, I'm not talking about the images that you see in this room. Mm. The image that the generation beneath you is Absolutely. looking at. And the thought processes behind these images, which are very, very well manufactured. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I say manufactured because I've seen some of these images that have gone viral, mm -hmm. start in a place where you wouldn't even believe it, the colour of the person. But ended up on your desktop, on your desktop, and you're sharing that and making that even more viral. And in, in essence, what you're doing is you're perpetuating the same madness. Mm -hmm. So my advice is this, and I said a statement on my page once, don't send me no images of violence. Mm -hmm. Don't send me no footage of no young person being stabbed to death. Don't send me no image of black love nude. I don't want to see it. I want to see black love as it is, as we can see here. Don't send me no images of broken relationships or no images of girls naked. I don't want to see them. Send me images of love. And you know what? Your friends list reduces. Yeah. 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 You do that. Yeah? Thank you for listening. That's all. Please. That's the inspiration. inspiration. Oh, blessings. Such a blessing to be here. Yes, so um, my husband was telling me about the work that we do, and I mean, as an offshoot from the community work with Soapbox, I also do, I speak up 
for the sisterhood because I mm -hmm. found that there was that disparity between us and we had to share notes, we had to talk and we had to heal together and um, we all bleed the same and I just felt that I could help doing that and so that was part of our journey and um, what was concerning me is that we can tend to shoot our own selves in the foot, I'm mm -hmm. just going to say it, we were. Okay, so I heard a lot about slavery, I heard a lot about trauma, I heard a, I heard a lot about lots of things that might even affect you and you haven't mentioned now but there is trauma there is healing a lot of healing to do that's a fact i don't know who's getting on with it but i'm certainly in the business of getting on with it in my marriage um what we found was helpful um was to mind our own business um, that business was what we had at home first and foremost and then what we could obviously give from there what we had we could give from there so it's your own experience it really is unique black love is indomitably unique so you have to find your way there's no easy way about it the savior syndrome sometimes we have that and mm -hmm. then nobody's coming to save you mm -hmm. you're going to have to do it yourself if you want to find somebody in this room, there's a lot yeah. of professional in this room and they're offering a lot of techniques but sometimes we go away and we don't do anything about it after mm -hmm. that so it's our own responsibility each and every person in this room you've had love given to you i don't i know something my bad may have happened to you but you've had love in some respect you've had love to some degree and you must be able to pass something down or add to that love you know don't just sit there with it share it mm -hmm. you know that's how we get we get it across we get our points across you know um my mom was a great woman and um, she did show us love also we grew up in domestic violence but it didn't have to i didn't have to pass that on because i was aware that it wasn't good for me I, I was aware that i wasn't going to pass it on and I knew that the man that I was going to find, because I made sure I wrote up who I wanted in my life. I didn't want just anyone, mm. because I wasn't going to be just anyone. So it is <coughs> down to us. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's stop making excuses. Let's stop making excuses, because if we fall into victimhood, we're stuck. And I'm mm. telling you, we've been here for too long. Yeah. And it looks like we're going to be here for some more time if we don't get walk away from this meeting and do something different. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just like, <laughs> <laughs> just, just, we'll come back, we'll come sorry, back. We'll come back. Just really yeah. Also, just, just very quickly, um, yes, just, yes, just yes. fast, you, you're going to have to allow me because that's what I do for a business. I get on people's nerves with a microphone. That's what I do. Okay, so, so everything here today, and I've said this at so many meetings that I've gone to, is what is the takeaway? And the takeaway from here today is so powerful, get this, it's free. The takeaway is just do. Absolutely. Just go into your community and love what you do. Absolutely. Love your brother, love your sister, love them children. Because them children can't see no love from this. So what I'm saying is, is, even though it's happening here today, and we all feel that love, share it. Share it. On my page. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah, definitely. Okay. We've spoken a little bit about men this evening, and I uh, just wanted to reintroduce Dr. Valerie Bernard I'll just talk. Allen, Time. Who has, that's okay. Okay. Who has written several books. Since, no, um, I've done a PhD. Research. She's done a PhD in research. Sorry, my bad. Um, actually, let, let me, me talk for myself. Yeah. So, yeah. let me just talk, because I've got two minutes, only two minutes. Right, let me tell you a story, and I'll do it in two minutes. So, when my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, messed up my life, Right? I had to make a very difficult decision to give up my PhD or start again. And I spoke to my son and I said, I said Jamal, what do I do? And he said, Mommy, you grieve. You grieve what's happened to you. And it's a long story, but it's with the R word. You know, I'm not supposed to be achieving, etc. He said, you grieve and then you get up and you start again. So that's what I did. And I sat on my husband's lap many days rewriting my PhD. And my PhD is about black women who are single. And so here I was having this experience, my lovely husband sitting there sort of like, do you, one day he sat there for seven hours and he said, Biebs, I need to go to toilet, you know. So, <laughs> can I just, you know, I was just tired. It was so traumatic for me after years of doing the research, but I had a burn and that burn was to do something for my community. And my burn was about the levels, the high levels of singleness amongst black women. 65% of Caribbean women are unpartnered in this country. 
And it's the same problem in Canada. I would work in Canada sometimes. It's the same, you know, wherever there is a post-enslaved community, there are high rates of singleness. We talk about single black women and correlated with that is strong black women. And I know some of you have got a problem with it, but I have spent many years sort of investigating it. I've got one minute left. Therefore, as a result of that, I have just um, put together a, a book, which some of you, I didn't even have time to do good flyers or whatever because they asked me just to come last minute. They heard me on the radio speaking. So I've, I, it's not even completely done, but it's out there now. You can get the book, The Seven Habits for Black Women Who Want to Marry. These habits are not both based on hocus pocus. It's based on an understanding as a sociologist how societies actually emerge and are sustained. I have spent many years considering the construction of societies and part of it, as you've all said, is marriage. But there are particular methods that enable societies to sustain, sustain itself. And my book actually sort of unravels some of those methods. I also run training sessions for women who want to marry. And I'm running a program right now in the north of England for women who are just, they want to understand how it is that, you know, they can get married to somebody who's productive. Some of this stuff is based on my own personal experience. I just happened across some of the methods and some things I understood. And one of the things that I had to do, I had to go to my mother and tell my mother to release me, release me from that narrative that black man now do not feel. Right? I said, you need to let that, you need to release me from this. My mother used to say, no man go and mind you. I grew up hearing that. So when my first marriage broke up, you know, there I was, no man was minding me. And I said, that's it, I'm on my own. And when my father died, it really did resonate for me. I needed to understand those processes. And as a result of my personal experience, my sociological understanding and my understanding of spiritual principles, I have put something together. That's it. Family, thank you so much and thank our panel. I wish we owned this building so that we didn't have to leave because every time we have these meetings, we get to such a precipice and everybody is broken down, everybody is relaxed, everybody's got over their funny faces coming from work. And that's exactly who they are. I'm going to hand it to Tony because Tony needs to speak, but I just really wanted to say this in that. We come with so many blockages, and it doesn't matter where I speak, I will always see three or four faces in the audience. And I, it's funny, I was at The Nation on Sunday, and I was speaking at the Saviour's Day. And what I know about us is we learn from watch, not from listen. We don't want to be preached to, no matter what the person thinks they know, like me in my very finite wisdom, no matter what men do. Nobody wants to see you preach. And you'll get the faces so they can do it in their head. And then I look in the audience, and I'm not discouraged, because I love or not, I love you more than you hate yourself. I love you more than they hate you. And I see, like I just mash up everything about their day. There was one woman in particular, and I'm not gonna extend the point, but she's just looking at me on Sunday. Like, she needed to use the toilet. Like, I had two gallons of meat. And she was desperate when she looked at me. And I know why. Because when we speak about black love, and ultimately, when we went to the park the other day with my son, uh, which is why I love my woman, because she's accepted him into our life and our relationship. Um, we, we, we spoke on this, and it's a very ordinary thing of how you treat me as a black human being for no good God-given reason. Mm. I know how you know feel about yourself. Mm. Not because I'm a summer dealer. Because sometimes I don't always dress like this. When I'm on the road, I'm just rough and ready. I wore a suit for the first... I worked for the first three years of my business, seven days a week apart from Christmas Day. I don't do that anymore. I wore a suit for seven years. I don't do that anymore. I just come so, and I'm wearing the jeans and a jacket, and I know how much black people feel about themselves based on how they treat me for no good God-given reason. And it's funny, 
On Sunday, when, when I was wearing my suit, and my lady was wearing her outfit, and there were, and I'm wrapping up, don't worry. Okay. Um, we saw English people look at us, and you can see the respect. And you see somebody like, <laughs> and it is just that. How we feel about ourselves for no God given reason. I mean, you can see a child somewhere, and there's somebody else. It's not somebody else's youth. That's my youth. Mm -hmm. As a young man, today came in my shop. He wanted to buy a jacket. And he didn't have any money in his front, and then he left. And I kept seeing him go past. And every time he saw me, he threw it away. He said, No, I'm coming in. I said, Come and give me a hand. I said, Don't feel any way when you see me. I have been where you are, and don't feel no pressure. It's in a bag, it's in the back. If you come back and see me in a week, if you come back and see me in a month, I said, that's yours. I said, you've never been where I'm standing, and you're gonna pay this forward. Mm -hmm. I said, no matter where you're the money. I said, you're gonna come back, but don't feel pressured, because it's a thing that we have. And you see, if we don't speak it, it's because we don't have the consideration of each other as Africans. And when we were slaves, we got married. And when we were slaves, we sang. And you see this Kardashian, this bastard. <laughs> we rediscovered his Africanness. Go look on YouTube as he's thumping on the keyboard and he's surrounded by the choir of his brothers and sisters. Naturally, that's a full blown African. No matter his bipolar disorder or anything else. When we're surrounded by us, and we know unapologetically, as Africans, we can just be ourselves. We are in love with our own reflection. I don't.